Okay. And here it is here. It was holly and it had an inner and outer rim and feet. And I used um, uh, this uh, reciprocating carver by Ryobi. And I, I have a set of uh, the flex cut power carving tools. And that's, that's where I started. I was doing everything with a with a blade, basically. Okay, next slide. And I was happy with that how this one turned out. It's a nice piece of holly. And then I decided we'll make three grooves. So I did this one. Again, the, the same same tree. Um, and I used uh, because it's holly and it doesn't finish very well. I used the paint on the exterior. And again, this was all done with with blades and the power carver. Then I got um, thinking that uh, my wife has a flower garden. I said, well, maybe I can try and make stuff that looks like a flower. So that's when I started, I didn't bring this piece, but uh, started trying to create the effect of a petal around a vessel. And this was another holly piece I did. Okay, next. And then this one here is this one right here. And that when I did this again, this was done with the with the blades and the Ryobi. And but this time I left the petal. I didn't paint that part, so it helped it kind of stand out a little bit. And this I was trying to simulate like an iris or something like that. I don't know exactly. And then we'll go to the next one. <laughs> And this is where I was trying to create a, a illusion of a tulip there. And that's again, Holly. And then I figured I'd try and see what I can do in, in walnut. And I, I like this shape form uh, a lot. And so I did a, a form, I did put three feet on it and I carved the, uh, the petal but then I did something, I added a little bit extra. I took a, a um, blade, the curved blade. If you can see the set comes with various different curved blades, a coat like for cutting a cove. And I use that to create that cove around the, the, the pedal area. And it kind of gives it a little bit more definition that, that there's some, a change there. Okay, the next slide. And then that, that moved on to this piece. And by the time I got to this piece, this is Cherry. The, I come back from the Raleigh exposition and I ran into Jim Bumpus down at the exposition and he introduced me to Sabretooth uh, carving, rotary carvers. And so I bought a few when I was there and it just had so happened I had purchased uh, the Christmas before a Dremel tool with a flex shaft. So this is what I used when I first started using rotary carvers. I used this Dremel tool. I just had a thing I hang it up and, and used it for carving. And here are some of the first uh, tools I bought are the, the saber tooth. They come in three uh, coarse, a uh, very coarse one, a medium, and one they call a whisper, which is a very fine um, cutting tool. But, but this, I was real pleased with how this turned out, and I really liked how the rotary carvers worked. And so I pretty much do all my carving with the rotary carvers. I still have these that I call on, but I end up putting them in a handle and do uh, hand carving to, to get areas where I can't can't get at with the rotary carver. Okay, next slide. That's a bowl that I did, a uh, cherry bowl. Again, I created a, a, like a three-dimensional effect on each one of those petals. And I did a little burning between each petal. And the, this one, you can see over on the left, on the inside, you can see a little bit what I was talking about with that burn through. Um, it wasn't too bad on this because of the thickness of the wall, but uh, it's just something you got to think about if you're going to do any burning on the outside of a, a vessel or a bowl. Okay, next slide. And this is uh, this piece right here. This I just turned this maybe 
six months ago. Uh, it's a chestnut oak vessel. And again, you can see, uh, I'll pass this around. You can really see how I kind of cut that out. And I'll be doing that up here on this piece right here in a few minutes. I, I like, I know a lot of you guys probably turn your nose up at oak, but it's one of my favorite woods to, to turn. Okay, next. That's a walnut um, piece. That's, uh, I was trying to simulate, if you've seen clay artists, they'll turn a, a bowl and then they cut it and then they overlap it. And I was trying to create that same effect in wood. And, and so I wasn't trying to do the sculpting around each, each uh, piece. I was trying to make it look like a, it was a, a clay it had been physically cut and, and folded. All right, next slide. And then I've gotten into doing a few other things. This is uh, another chestnut oak uh, piece. Or wait, no, excuse me, this is beech. This is beech and it had some spalting in the sapwood. But uh, this one, I did like a spiral top and just put a, a vertical uh, groove in it, if you want to call it. If you look over on the right, I had, uh, there's some butterfly repairs. I had the thing, the thing looked beautiful. I had finished it um, and I was going to paint the interior with latex paint. And when that water hit that thing, that crack popped open and it went down about two thirds of the way down the side. So that's why I, I said, by God, I'm not gonna throw this one away. So I made a, made a repair, uh, a couple of butterfly repairs, glued it back together. And uh, so I, I salvaged it. No, 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 I, I kind of cut it out. Yeah, they don't, they don't go all the way through, no. It's kind of a, I don't have the rig that there's some guy in Hawaii that so I don't know, you may have no, know him from the club out there and he's got to use a router and all that stuff and he's got dies and I just uh, hand cut everything. But I, I'm getting better at it. The first one I did was a lot rougher than these, but I, I'm getting better at it. Okay. And then one thing that when I brought this in, this is kind of my, the last, my latest work, and I decided to try and make some leaves. So I turned this bowl in chestnut oak, and I'm making uh, ginkgo leaves around the outside. And the only thing I have left to do on it, I'm going to kind of try and create some veins on the leaves and then uh, do the you know, little finished sanding. But uh, that's my first attempt at at putting some sort of a leaf or something on, on the outside. Okay, next slide. Yeah, that's my workshop. Uh, I do all my carving. I have a large table in the center of the workshop and I set my, my uh, Fordham tool up there and uh, I sit in a, in a uh, uh, stool and, and carve away. And on the far side, I have a bench that's set up for finishing. Uh, and then I have a drill press, a sander, the bandsaw, and then I use a Grizzly uh, uh, vacuum system for when I'm sanding mainly, or when I'm running one of the machines to collect the sawdust. Next slide. And that's just the view from the other side of the area. It's an old garage and uh, just converted it to a, a workshop. All right, next. Now this is the piece of wood that this was turned from. I thought I'd go ahead and go through these slopes real quickly so you can see how I created this. And that was a piece of uh, chestnut oak and it had some nice spalting in the sap wood. Okay, next slide. I use for, uh, generally for turning uh, something like this, I use an Irish grind uh, gouge. That's a Ellsworth gouge. Um, Okay, next slide. And there I'm working on it. One of the first things I try and do is I try and get the tenon created because once you have the tenon, you can really start shaping it. You've got the foundation and uh, you can go from there. So I try and get that done right away. Okay, next. 
And I hear it's just moving on uh, through it, trying to define the shape. I haven't started creating the, um, the feet yet. Okay, next slide. And there's, I just wanted to show what I normally wear. I have a, a, a filtration system. It's that's a JSP system. I always wear that. I always wear earplugs because um, I found out last year I've lost 25% of my hearing. I don't lose any more. So um, I wear these uh, uh, Bluetooth uh, earplugs and I got them here at Woodcraft. And they work great. Even if you don't want to play music, they're the best earplug I've ever, ever had. No, no, I, these don't, I think, do that. But um, yeah, they're the ISO tune. Yeah, but they also serve as Bluetooth. Yeah, yeah, and they're really good, real good. I, I've been very pleased with it. Okay, there's I've finished turning it, and I've got my shape. The part on the red right that you see flaring out is going to be the the feet. I'll be carving away about ninety percent of that. Okay, next slide. And here I am creating this inner rim. And I, for that, I generally use gouges. I use either, a, a, I have a, a large Ellsworth gouge and I have a smaller one. And then I use a, a detail gouge also to create the, the inner rim. All right, next slide. And there it is finished and sanded. I didn't worry about sanding the, the center because that's all gonna be carved away, turned away. Then I use uh, uh, Trent Bosch's uh, visualizer system for hollowing. And I, I just got that about a year ago and it's fantastic, <laughs> I tell you. Um, I hollowed for ever using, you know, through little holes like that and then use a wall thickness gauge and all that, but now, you can see on the TV screen in the background, you see where your tool is at all times. And uh, you put a little line there where you, whatever wall thickness you want, and you just make sure you don't cross the, um, the, outside, of the outside of the vessel. So it, it's really, really fantastic. Huh? About a thousand bucks. It's about a thousand bucks. Yeah, yeah. They can't hear questions because we only have your microphone. Oh, he, uh, Robert asked how much it cost. And it was right about $1,000 investment. And for me, it was well worth it. Of course, I, well, yeah, I already had all the Trent Bosch tools. That's one of my, in hollowing, I use either Ellsworth or Trent Bosch. And so I had the, had the tools. So I just bought the, the system to go with it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 arm. Yeah. Seven hundred, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I um. I had enough money I'd made from selling stuff, so I I burned it on on that and I haven't regretted it all right next slide and there it is uh reversed put it onto the chuck um and uh it's pretty probably pretty much done there now one thing I want to note see those two pencil marks on it before you finish and make that final cut to the bottom you have to decide where the bottom is going to be and that's what these marks are here. And you can see how you can start passing that around. I go ahead and put those marks on there. And then I also, if you go to the next slide, I sketch the profile of the outside of the bottom on the, on the bowl. And then I finish hollowing it. Okay, next slide. Uh, for after I get it where I want it profile wise, I took that uh, uh, axe 
tool and I use that to scrape and smooth the inside. So it gives you a really, really nice finish on the inside after you've, I, I used the Bosch hollowing tools and then went to that to finish. The cup? Yeah. No, I have not tried the cup yet. If you get the angle right. It does a good job, yeah. Yeah, I haven't tried that yet. Now, if you look on that thing, there's some lines. And I, uh, when I get, while well, the piece is still on the lathe, I try and decide where um, I'm gonna put the feet. Because I wanna put it so that when I do the carving, I kind of take advantage of the wood grain that's in the, in the bowl. So that's what I'm getting ready to do there. And I have these templates that I made um, when I took Avelino Samuels class and there are different numbers of pie sections. And uh, this is the one that has six or, or three. And that's what I chose since I'm gonna have three feet. I use this template. Okay, next slide. Then I have a little jig I made where the pencil is right at the spindle height. And I just score a line across the side of the, of the bowl. Next slide. And there it is after the they've been done. And then I've got it. I have a vacuum chuck, but I always turn these things so that the hole isn't big enough to fit on the vacuum chuck. So I um, use a jam chuck and there's all set up to try and cut off the bottom. Okay, next slide. Okay, and there is a important part. You have to uh, have some way to measure your progress when you're hollowing out that that bottom so i just this is a very precise instrument and take the triangle and set it on the edge and then i take this piece of it's an old um placemat uh at the uh lowest point in the um outside profile okay next slide okay, and i start turning it hollowing it out and i check See how far I'm along. I've got to go about another eighth to a quarter inch. Next. And there I am right on. Now that gets me, I know I'm at the right depth in the center. Then I've got to go ahead and get the profile finished. So what I'll do is I'll use this. I can just slide it along and I just compare the, um, wherever that bowl is. You just compare on the outside and then put it on the inside and see if you've got the same distance if everything is agreeing. Okay, next slide. And there's the finished uh, hollow. And so far, I've done a bunch of these and I have not goofed yet. And uh, uh, you'll see when I start carving away the um, that wing, uh, if you, you know, get it off and you're too close to that bottom, you can easily punch right through when you're carving. But uh, I sand that and uh, then it's ready to go. And now I think that's the last slide, is it? Nope, there's the finished, finished product right there. All right, well, let me start carving. Let's see, where's, where's the thing I'm gonna carve on? There it is. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how I how I designed this this vessel, which is going to be very similar to this. This is a little different in that the the top is actually sloped, so each pedal is a different height. But this one is going to be just straight across, so there'll be three pedals that should look roughly the same. And one thing I try to do, if you look at that, I try to make sure the the shape of the of the pedal doesn't conflict with the outside profile of the bowl. You know, if you had tried to do something straight or something odd, it would really look funny. So I go in and I try and make sure that I, I do a profile that um, uh, complements the, the shape of the bowl. And then I do different style feet. This one has kind of a, a rounded profile. Now I do some like the, one over there, it's a straight uh, profile. To make that, I will uh, use a saw. 
you know, one of those Japanese saws and cut it down to a point. And then I can finish the rest of it with one of these rotary carvers to where I really need to be, but I'll use a, a saw to get it started. Um, and then trying to think of anything else. Can't think of anything. Let me go ahead and start carving. I'm going to try and do it without a mask on, but I may, I'm going to make a lot of sawdust. So um, I may have to put it on. I, I like to, I hold the piece in my lap. I know some people like to carve on a stand and all that. I can't do that. I hold it in my lap and I just feel, feel more comfortable that way. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to carve the feet. Get those first, and then uh, I'll change to a different type of tool and do the uh, uh, the pedals. This Fordham runs at about eighteen thousand RPM when you have it all the way cranked up. Um, I usually run around ten thousand RPM, something like that, when I'm doing doing this. Another thing I do when I'm carving, I always try to hold the tool so I'm pointing at the center, always pointing toward the center of the, of the bottom. You ever really, uh, any of you familiar with Liam Flynn, the Irish turner? He passed away a couple of years ago. Um, I really admired that man and I was very upset when he, when he passed away. There's a video of him making something like this on YouTube. It's about a 10 minute video. <clears throat> it doesn't have any music, no narration. It's just him working and making one of these. And when he, roughs the feet he uses a uh, uh, uh arbor tech and it takes him like two seconds to make it it'll take me a little longer but it, it's just that's if you want to see a really neat video it's it's a there are only two videos i've seen on youtube that feature liam flynn and a, so if you just use his name, type in his name, but it's, it's an excellent video. That takes about two minutes to two, do that. Two seconds, so if you watch him, it's like zhip. I, it's on my list. Oh, okay. okay, it's on my wish list. It is on my wish list. Now, I, I, I just bought a thing for this. It's a angle grinder attachment. And I can't wait to try that because you can get some really aggressive cutters for that. And I want to want to try that and see if that's a little quicker.
one thing too, this is chestnut oak. And if you think, you know, you hear about how stinky red oak is, well, this has it beat. It is, it is when it's green, it'll stink up the whole house. Yeah, it, it, it's bad. I'm just going to get this close. No, no, it does a pretty good job. This is actually, this isn't a saber tooth. This came with the Fordham. It's one of their cutters. <laughs> oh, yeah. What was the, it was that I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm bearing down fairly, fairly good on it. Um, this wood is dried out quite a bit. If it were green, it would be cutting a lot easier, but it's, it's, it's dried out. I turned this last week and it, it's, it's done quite a bit of drawing, drying, but uh, yeah, this, these carvers, they're a very good rotary carver. If you want to get one now, I got the one that sits on a table. You can get the one that hangs up. The thing I didn't like about that is every time you use it, you got it. If you're taking it somewhere else and it's not in your workshop, you got to find a place to hang it up. So this, this works great. You just sit down and, and work with it. I always take my thumb and just run it over. I can see where I'm at. Now I'm at this point right now, this is a coarse cutter. I'm going to stop and I'm going to move over to the other side and at least get one foot defined. And then I'll, I'll work on this area here so you can see how that differs. Uh, change sides. <clears throat> you can change the directions on the. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, got a lot of sawdust. You can change the directions and hold it this way. But if you do, when you get close to that end, it'll try and jump over. So I always switch and come into the 
into the foot. Yeah, when I'm doing this carving, I've got that whole regalia on too. I wear that um, that mask, that uh, headgear. And um, I'm going to rig up uh, the way I sit at my table. The table would be right here. I'm going to rig up a box fan and put a shroud on it and put a filter on it and uh, have it blowing away from me. But at least create that negative flow so it'll help pull some of that dust away. Because <laughs> it... Clean the dust off your oh, I'm, I'm fine, yeah. It's pretty dusty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. <laughs> now I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm gonna change cutters. Did this thing go off? Okay, it's working all right. All right, let me change cutters. And all these, you just pull, pull the old one off. And this is a, this is a number forty-four cutter. That's why if you buy a, a Fordham, this it'll come with this cutter. It's kind of. You can see how fat it is. It's okay when I'm doing the roughing work, but it's just too big if you're trying to do fine work, too big a diameter. So they make what they call <clears throat> a number 28, which is this one. <clears throat> the difference is it's smaller in diameter. Almost this, this is a half inch cutter and uh, it's, it's not quite that small, but it, it really helps when you're in there trying to get this thing real flat. <clears throat> the one disadvantage is this can't take a quarter inch shaft so you have to either <clears throat> use an eighth inch or the 332nd uh shafts you just gotta make sure you line up everything with your there's a little tab on this there we go all righty now what i'm gonna do is just do a little little finish work right around the foot so I can get started on this part here. Well, this cutter, this is a, um, this is one of those whispers. It's the finest one that Sabretooth makes. And it, uh, I'd say it's about equivalent to an 80 grit sandpaper with the kind of finish you get on it. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Okay, I think that's close enough for now. I'll turn it off for a sec. That's basically the way the foot will, will look in the end. Um, I'll get it uh, when I, after I do this part here, I'll talk a little bit about sanding and what I do with sanding. Um, because you, you do have to do a lot of that with this. Alrighty, now I'm going to start cutting out this part of the, the pedal. And um, what I usually do is I right down about in this area, I'll just start uh, with, uh, I, I do a quarter inch thick wall. Uh, that's important. And then I usually try and do about an eighth of an inch relief when I do the, the carving. Um, and that gives me, leaves me a little bit. Um, all right, what am I doing here? There. All right, come on. There we go. Okay, good. When I do an eighth inch relief here, I still have an eighth inch of wall thickness to which is which is plenty. All right, let's start. I usually just come in. Well, this cutter, there are no teeth on the end. They make the first ones I bought, I didn't wasn't thinking I bought ones with the teeth on the end. You don't want those. You want no teeth on the end. Good. I'm okay. I got a little heavy going through there, but it's still okay. Okay. Then what a next step is, a, is to kind of flatten this out a little bit. So I'll come in and just start cutting material out. You just kind of transition that into the existing shape. Okay. 
Well, the other thing you have to find when you're doing this is, and you're wearing all this stuff on your face is resist, resist the temptation to blow. You just can't do it. <laughs> Now what I'm doing here, I always, when I mark this side of the pedal, I always carry the line over because I'm going to carve the one I had out. So I'm going to put that back in so I can see where I'm going to be cutting to. Now I'll start shaping this, this portion. And what I've done is created that that little valley there in the um, petals where the two petals overlap. Um, one thing the problem I'm having with this is the this is quite hard the heartwood, but the sapwood is pretty soft, so I got to be real careful when I'm when I'm cutting there. But the, I'll be able to sand that out and get it nice and smooth. And something I'll use too is a, like a small file. This is one of those Japanese files. I think this is the second cut, as they call it, fineness. And I like it because they don't have any teeth on the side. So you can, you can go in and file right up to a, a vertical surface. It's real handy, handy file. I'll use that to uh, clean things up. Also, these things are handy. Um, I got these from uh, M MDI or something. That's a carving supply place up in Maine. And they sell them in two coarsenesses. The red is a 200, equivalent to 200 grit, and the uh, black are equivalent to 80, 80 grit. Yeah, that would be one of the 80 grit. You can buy, one of these days I'll invest in a real nice set of um, uh, the files. They're like two, three hundred dollars, something like that. Okay, let's see. Now there, I've got my pedal. I got a little heavy right through here, but I'm still good. I got, I got some wood there, so it didn't. I didn't punch through. But uh, and and you just round it. I probably could do a little bit more rounding on that. I won't do it tonight. But uh, try and get that transition a little bit flatter than it is there now. All right. Yeah, I did all this with the whisper. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they just came out with them like a year ago or something like that. They, uh, before they just had the, uh, the fine and the coarse, but the, but the whispers are really great, really great. Um, it took me about two hours to turn this and get it ready. Um, on this, something like this, I'll probably spend four hours carving. Now that that thing there, 
I've been put uh, double that at least on the thing with the leaves. Um, and that, I spent a lot of time on that. But, um, probably, I've got probably 10 hours of carving in that right there. All right, let me change to the, the ball. And this is just a little half inch ball. And it's a whisper, uh, the fine, their finest. Um, and all these have an eighth inch shank. Okay, now what I'm going to do is use that to come along this edge of the pedal and create that trying that turned up effect. Now, when I'm doing this, I try and go right up to the edge of that vertical uh, cut. One thing I, you notice the burning, and that's the problem I've, uh, uh, you have when you're cutting the end grain. It won't do that when you're cutting the side grain. But if you're right on the end grain, you're going to get a little burning. Generally, you can get that out with the sanding. I don't know. I think it, I get a little bit too aggressive, and I think that doesn't help it any. I, I'm pressing too hard. But if I think if you use a little, if I were a little more patient, a little lighter touch, I probably wouldn't have that much of it. I'm getting into the sapwood, so I got to be real, a little bit more careful. I'm going to stop here because there's another step now after I do this. Smooth it out a little bit. Okay, I think that's all I want to do on that. 
I'll change back to the other cutter. But you can see what I did. I just basically put a little dimple. And then what I'll do, you know, sawdust mice, um, I'll take that flat cutter again and then I'll taper it out like I did here. So it just kind of transitions out nicely into the rest of the of the pedal. <clears throat> As something I'll show you too is uh, at the symposium, the virtual symposium, I was able to watch a couple of people. I watched uh, Trent Bosch, he carved, uh, I forget what he calls these vessels he does. It looks like one inside the other or something like that. And then I watched Dixie Biggs do the leaves on a uh, uh, hollow form. And she uses, she doesn't use this type of cutter. She uses a higher speed, one of those little, uh, mini, uh, they call them micromotor type carvers. They go up to like 50,000 RPMs and she uses stump cutters. And I'll show you one. And I'm, I'm going to be using them more. I'll probably use, this is what I'll use to cut the veins on the um, leaves. But it's a little, uh, these are high speed steel. So you can you can grind them, grind off the uh, end. When you buy them, they come like this with a, um, can you see it? It's rounded and it's got teeth there, which is obviously you don't want that. So you take and put it on your grinding wheel and <clears throat> grind it off. So you basically have the same kind of cutter, except it's the stump cutters where they have like a little blade cuts the stuff off instead of um, uh, the tooth, the little carbide tooth that's in the uh, saber tooth. But I, I, I won't use that here because I'd have to change the, this is a 332nd shaft and the uh, saber tooth are an eighth inch. So I'd have to change it, but I noticed that's what she used uh, for majority of her carving. And um, uh, I've, I've done a little bit with it, but uh, I want to do a little bit more when I do the veins on those leaves. All right, let's put the straight one back in. Let's see where the round was. There they are. Oh, there it is.
don't want to cut a hole in the top of the table. But there you can see the um, profile you end up with there. And then <clears throat> you can, um, after I do all this, I, I do all the sides, I get the rim the way I want it. <clears throat> Generally I'll hand sand the, the profile of the rim. And one thing I try and do <clears throat> is I, I try and have the surface of the rim be 90 degrees to the, whatever the wall of the um, uh, vessel's doing. I do a 90 degree profile. Um, then sanding, I use, I've got a little one inch. Um, I just grab something out of here I didn't want. A little one inch uh, disc sander that fits in a, a quarter inch mandrel. And I can use that pretty well to get in here. I go up right over along the edge and um, sand that smooth, get all the unevenness out of it. Usually I might start with a 120 grit, but uh, uh, very quickly change to a finer grit after that. <clears throat> um, and also what I'll do is um, you can use this file and you can go along this edge here and smooth that out using a file. Uh, the feed again, use the one inch disc sander. Then I also have, um, these are these uh, little sanding domes and you can get cylindrical ones too. I like these cause you don't, you won't cut a line on the, the one end. And I'll come in here and use that to sand this radius area out. <clears throat> I basically have gotten to the point where I try to do as much machine sanding as I can. When I first started doing this, like with that cherry one, I it was mostly hand sanding and it was a pain in the ass. And um, <clears throat> the one thing, when you um, do this part, you let that disc ride just right up to that edge. You don't put a lot of pressure. And what it actually will do, it does a little cutting and it'll actually help enhance that, that slope. But you gotta be careful if you get too aggressive, you'll, you'll either cut through and have a, have a bump in your rim. Um, but uh, I mean, it's, just, it's just an art. You just gotta kind of just take it easy and just go right up to it. And I use um, use the Fordham to do that. It just you have really good control holding that thing. I don't ever try and use a big angle grind, angle drill or anything like that. That's um, that's brutal. Um, but uh, that's about it in a nutshell. You know, if we have enough time, if somebody wants to come up here and try and use any of these, I've got a vessel over here that's I can sacrifice to the cause it's it's one I it's one I made a mistake on and I just set it aside for maybe occasion just like this but uh any any questions how long do your birds last these I these things are um, that's two years old. I mean, they, sharp. yeah, they're still sharp. Is it metal or stone? It's a metal. I, I don't know what saber tooth uses, if they're carbide, if the actual tooth is carbide or not. I, I suspect it is because as long as they last, they last a long time. That's a medium. You clean it out. What I do take a brush that's what this is for what i do is i set it on the table and i turn the thing down to like quarter speed and just lightly touch it on the bristles and it, it cleans it right up <clears throat> you got to be real careful if you get toward the edge they'll catch a thing and they'll wrap it around here and then you got to take it off to get that yeah out. yeah um but uh yeah, basically use that straight one. I do use this. This one here, it's like a little um, cone. 
you don't really need it on something like this, but when I was doing the leaves, I used it to get into some of the corners and stuff like that. You can get into areas where you can't get with the others with that little point. It looks like it would take a lot of control on the sanding from dipping down. Yeah, you got to just be be careful. That's the one thing. That's why I like doing this way. I, I've got the thing in my legs. I know. I know if anybody else in the winter Abilene Samuels thing. Uh, it's like having an extra pair of hands when you got it right there, and uh, then I can take the. The, uh, well, especially when I get that right angle thing, I'll be able to hold it like this and I'll have really nice control when I go in here. I had one, I didn't bring the vessel. <clears throat> I got a, um, let me see if I got it out here. I don't see it. Um, let me pull this out. It looked like this. It was a sanding disc, um, but it's real stiff and I, didn't realize it, but I was letting it get drift too close to the vertical surface. So I had a groove. So I've, I've got to go back and I'm going to have to cut, recut this and get rid of that groove. And then I'll use the, the disc, the flexible disc or the way to go. They don't seem to mark, cut leave a mark. All the other, huh? Or cut a groove and all the other. Yeah, yeah, make them all uniform. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing I want to try and do is um and i got to go back and look at dixie biggs and see how she did it but she on her leaf she undercuts them I, I can't remember what tool she used to do it but i've got this one here which is like at a 45 degree and i it had teeth on it again and i ground those off and i'm thinking maybe i'm gonna try and come right through here and kind of undercut that that vertical surface and see how that works then I've got this one, which is kind of curved. It's got a little bit of a curve to it. And I, I still need to grind the um, teeth off the end of it. But, uh, is, is the Fordham, it's a higher speed than the Dremel? Yeah, I think, I think it is. I don't know how high a Dremel goes. It, it goes to 18,000. Now the micro motor systems like, uh, you know, like Dixie Biggs, that's all she uses. They go up to 50,000 RPM. Is that what Dan uses on his I don't know what Dan uses a micromotor or is his is air driven. I'm not sure. Are Dan, are you on? I don't know if he's on. I am if I don't. <laughs> is he there? Well, he's there. He's there. Okay. Yeah. Four Dans instead of one. Hey, if you want to check, type it in the chat. Then I can, uh, tell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if his is air driven or yeah or electric. Yeah. And the one thing, these um even though hers is super high speed, these have a ten thousand RPM limit on speed. Can I try this? Yeah. Okay. Got the right one. No, uh, mine is uh air driven and it goes to five hundred thousand. <laughs> That's uh, so yeah, I think the Dremel is about 25,000, you were right, I think about 18 on that. Uh, yes, but the air driven motor goes, the dental drill goes to about 500,000. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah. All right.